Hi, everyone. Um, so, I am Tatiana Bazzichelli from the Disruption Network Club and uh, very happy to introduce uh, the last panel of our conference. Uh, um, the conference is our Sorties conference. Uh, uh, the title is Artivism, the Art of Subverting Power. And again, I want to thank uh, the speakers uh, and our audience, uh, both uh, here in Berlin and also online. And again, I want to remember the people that are following online that it's possible to ask questions via chat. So if you want to participate at the panel later, just remember that you, you can uh, type your question and our team uh, will then bring to our moderator during the panel discussion. So very happy to introduce uh, our panel, Breaking Evil, Artistic Action for Justice. And uh, I'm happy to also thank uh, still this poster, Michelle Tilitsky, Viter Zoo Collective, and our wonderful moderator, Natalia Ivanova Mautz, that I'm going uh, to introduce more pop properly. So, Natalia uh, is a cultural organizer, is a curator and author. She explored the intersection between art, law, and economics with special attention on the commons. She's originally from Bulgaria and lived in New York, where in the early 2000s she co-founded Flux Art Space. In the beginning of her career, she worked at MoMA PS1 and the Clock Tower in New York City. She has been developing alternative space and platform that create new opportunity for artists and art organizers to build autonomy, agents, and community. And also I have to say I had the pleasure to meet uh, Natalia in many of our trips between San Francisco and Oakland and also visit the great gallery, the Pro Arts, Pro Arts Gallery that she has been uh, directing for many years. Uh, and Natalia, you did really a wonderful work there. So very happy to welcome Natalia and these great uh, panelists. Uh, and uh, then to conclude our conference uh, before the workshops of tomorrow with this uh, wonderful discussion. Thank you. Welcome everybody. Thank you, Tatiana, for an amazing introduction. I am so excited to be the last panel, to the moderate the last panel, because you guys know that's going to be the funnest one, um, as the last one always promises to be. Um, and I would like to welcome the guests here tonight, still this poster, Michelle Tilitsky and Viderzo. Did I say it right? Okay, I'm practicing my German. <laughs> um, this panel, as you can read on the website, of course, um, brings together artists and activists challenging corporations, systemic powers, and social injustice, and fighting for the public good. Their tactics aim to empower people, touching issues of political and social relevance in the field of corporate copyright laws, greenwashing in advertising, and the power of gas lobby. They organize artistic actions and generate collective projects that span from subversing, ad busting, to awareness campaigns, showing how art and activism can contribute to imagine a better world and do it collectively. So, a lot. <laughs> um, I wanted to very quickly sort of contextualize tonight's conversation and bring, um, bring us all to um, to some of the questions that we'll be discussing tonight, or, or sort of like the, um, the methodology of this amazing artist here tonight, um, and the techniques they're using, which is uh, subvertising and culture jamming and, and, you know, sort of the torments in, in any way or fashion. And maybe just begin by bringing us all to this, um, to the seminal text of Guy Debord, The Society of the Spectacle, 1967, in which the author develops, presents the concept of the spectacle, a term he gives for the everyday manifestation of capitalist-driven phenomena, advertising, television, film, and celebrity. Debord says, the spectacle is not a collection of images, rather, it's a social relationship between people that is mediated by images. 
in a consumer society, social life is not about living, but about having. The spectacle uses the image to convey what people need and must have. Consequently, social life moves further, leaving a state of having and proceeding into a state of appearing, namely the appearance, appearance of the image. In world which really is topsy-turvy, the true is a moment of the false. Artists tonight will discuss their work, which aims to disrupt the flow of the media spectacle and ultimately rob it of its power. Through employing the techniques of subvert, subvert, sub, sub, subvertising and culture jamming, techniques originating in the practice of determinant, as we talked about situationist, um, which basically means overrun, overturning or derailment, right? Um, as Naomi Klein offers a way of speaking back to advertising, the artists tonight are forcing a dialogue where before there was only a declaration. Subversing and culture jamming, su sub advertising and culture jamming and subversing, of course. <laughs> a forms of protest used by many anti-consumerist social movements and artists to disrupt or subvert media culture and its mainstream cultural institutions, including corporate advertising, through using the techniques artists seek to expose the methods of domination of mass society. If, as Mark posits, the social relations within capitalist society exist between commodities and not between workers, then do workers even have social relations at all? If so, in one context, and are workers able to exercise conscious individual action or autonomy? So we'll begin this conversation after me planting some of this information in your heads. And please do think of some questions later for this panel um, by introducing you to still this poster. And um, still this poster is an online archive of subversive posters and a network of subvertisers based in the UK and Italy. It's made up by professional pirates of the outdoor advertising, providing free guerrilla communication and design services for radical groups around the globe. If you're looking for a poster to spread your subver subversive campaign, you might find some useful designs in our archive, they say. And let's hear more. Still this poster. Hello. Okay, thank you very much for uh, your invitation and wonderful presentation introduction. I'm, I'm a bit uh, emotionated of being, being here. So um, I will try in this uh, presentation to um, give you um, a look of what um, we did with our collective, which is based on advertising that we defined as a um, as the piracy of outdoor advertising and the hacking of corporate messages. But we tried to, to have like a um, broader view of this uh, definition. And yeah, that's what I will try to, to show you. Um, this, this, uh, this, first, uh, this first slide, this first photo is actually from um, an installation we did uh, last year in this same building um, at Kunstraum Kreuzberg, Britannien, uh, during a collective exhibition, and it reproduced uh, the homepage of our website, which is basically this archive of um, designs that you can download, uh, reproduce, print on your T-shirts, uh, in your um, uh, hang, hang up in your in your room, or or use to customize uh, the the advertising in your in your city. And uh, here we have um, an example. Basically, uh, by putting a poster under some glass um, glass shelves in in bus stops. Automatically, the the image seems to be official, and on this 
uh, on this appearance, we, as a collective, we we play a bit. Uh, this this is an example made of uh, by by three different artists uh, around the subject of anti-fascism, uh, with three different approaches. The the first one is uh, on on the left is um, let's say mimetic reinterpretation of H and M. Uh, which uh, which is depicted with uh, with these two infamous characters from from the history and makes some parallelism with how the industry of H and M works. The the central one uh, is um, highlighting the um, the conviction of any which is. Um, a petrol agency that was founded by the Italian state and now it's a private agency with um, with the Libya colonization uh, run during the fascist period uh, and uh, and now any is still the first uh, uh, sorry I'm a bit tense <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Well, <laughs> uh, Annie is still like the, fir the leading company, uh, gas company in, uh, in Libya. So this poster is, is basically denouncing it. The third one is, is a satirical poster which says, uh, be yourself, but if you are a dickhead, being yourself will not help you with, with a representation of a um, modern fascist. Well. This is just a, a first example of, of what we we do, but but actually starting from from this um, yeah let's say um, artistic re representation of three 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 posters in in, in outdoor spaces, then we also uh, collaborate with with other collective to do a bigger campaign. Uh, this this campaign uh, was curated by Brandalism, and it was uh, my my friend Michel Tilitsky will will explain about it uh, later on a bit a bit more in details. But now I wanted just to to show you some more photos as as, as example of this of this campaign uh, that was um, asking for ban fossil ads, and so. Uh, it was targeting uh, airplane companies, subverting their 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 designs and logos. This first first example was uh, designed by by Michel, and and the poster was uh, was put up in in Rome. Uh, the second one was part of the same campaign, and and is from Birmingham. And. Uh, and this third one is, is still in Rome and and is presenting um, yeah it's a satire about uh, an airplane company with a golf uh, field inside for for the business class um, so uh, so with with subvertising you you can do different different things you can uh, took took a poster from from the street, paint on them, and, and it's just, I don't know, a, a, a beautiful painting uh, that it's uh, hang on in, in the streets, or you can also organize bigger campaign like, uh, like this one. And, um, but, but why we decided to, to, to put all this design on, a, um, on an archive online in free download? Well, because of course, the, the um, uh, one of the aim is to challenge the um, copyright laws and the copyright in general as a as a mentality. Because we think that uh, we don't believe in the ownership of of an idea. Um, personally, I think that an idea is never the the production of a single individual self but of, of the context of the context of the social context of of this individual person and so it can be uh, privatized uh, so it's a statement 
but it's also um, a legal defense because um, for the copyright, for the international copyright laws, the responsible of a subverted um, logo, uh, it's not, for example, the person that is selling a t-shirt like this one with the subverted logo, but the media that, um, let's say, put, uh, that, 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 pub that publish it, yes. Yeah. So uh, there is a story behind, uh, behind this design uh, done by uh, Spelling Mistake Cost Lives. Um, spelling Mistakes made, made this design at the beginning and then it became really used by different environmental movements such as uh, Extinction Rebellions. It ki kind of became uh, a symbol for many struggles, so it was projected during demonstration uh, or um, painted over banners, and so it became a symbol. And he also printed these t-shirts and was, was, was selling, selling them to, selling them to, to, to finance uh, different projects. It happened that Shell get in contact with, um, with the artists asking, well, basically saying, you cannot, you cannot do that, you cannot sell the, the, the T-shirt. Of course, uh, the, uh, Shell can't forbid uh, demonstrators to, to use such an image during a demonstration, but it could say to, to Darren, uh, which is the name of, of the artist, sorry, to not sell the t-shirt. And, uh, well, a solution came by putting this uh, design on, on our archive, uh, because now they're responsible <laughs> of whatever happened with the, se the, the, the selling of, of this t-shirt is actually uh, still this poster, the, domain, the, the registered domain. So, so it kind of liberate this this image. Does it make sense? <laughs> nice. Um, so I wanted to, to show you a bit more um, what, what we did with the practice of subvertising, um, but without just, you know, um, without just to pick, pick a logo, a specific logo of uh, and, and subverting it and make it, I don't know, uh, deviate the, the, the meaning of the logo. Uh, we, we also collaborate with different activists group. Uh, you can, if, if, if you are part of a collective group and you need um, to, to amplify your, your voice, you can get in contact with us. We were, we were basically very inspired by, by the Yes Men as a kind of, of, of practice. And, and then we, we, we developed together with this activist group tactics to, to spread the, mm, the meaning that they, that they need. We did, in, in particular, we did um, many campaigns with Lucia Siesta, which is a um, squatted women house in, um, in Rome that provides uh, shelves for, uh, women, uh, for women escaping violence, situa violent situation, uh, and also uh, a help desk. And Lucia Siesta is really peculiar because it, it kind of, it, it's kind, it's, it is in this kind of bipolar, I will say bipolar position uh, because it, the, be, mm, sorry, uh, for the Italian laws, for the European laws, uh, every city, er, every city in Europe needs to have a certain number of shelves and help desk, and Rome is under this number. So Luce Siesta, by providing this help desk and these shelves, it, uh, it actually is actually helping the, the municipal city of Rome but is also under eviction because the place, the building, uh, has been squatted since about ten, ten years. And so the, the, the legal situation of Luce Siesta is it's bipolar because from one hand the state tried to evict it 
and from the other end, uh, it is obviously doing a very important and helpful, uh, fundamental uh, job, all run by volunteers. So uh, when uh, three years ago, Lucia Siesta received an, an eviction letter, they get in contact with us, and together we planned um, many different campaigns that we already uh, described uh, and, and, and yeah, tell uh, here at Disruption Network Lab during the pandemic with a short movie uh, called uh, Still This Poster, Artivism and the Struggle of Luce Siesta. You can look at it on YouTube, on the Disruption Network Lab YouTube channel. Uh, just searching the, the, the title of, 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 uh, of this short movie. Uh, but actually when, when we finished, when we published the short movie, the situation wasn't still solved. Like we managed to resist different uh, eviction, evictions, uh, but, but yeah, the, the, the situation was not solved and so we did some, some, some more stuff basically which I'll show you now. Uh, this, this, those, those photos are, um, let's, a reinterpretation of a Batman, kind of Batman signal <laughs> with, the, with a Luce Siesta logo that we projected in front of different monuments in, in Rome uh, as a um, call to action and and we took some evocative, nice photos of, of for example, the Luce Siesta on, on the ass of the horse uh, here, uh, of this statue in front of the Roman municipal and, and, and other stuff. And, and it was really useful to, after many eviction, after many attempts to, to, to evict Luce Siesta, the attention of the public was, was difficult to, uh, to, to, to keep, and so this, these photos really help to, to say, hey, the, the situation is not solved, we still need your help, so, uh, so please be, be, be present and, and help Luce Siesta in, in resist another attempt. It actually worked uh, well, because, because luckily Luce Siesta is still there, even if now the situation is complicated and it's, it's changed, but yeah, hopefully we will, I don't know, invent something else. Uh, after this this uh, this operation, um, we um, we did another one, which was in 2021 uh, in in July, which is um, a particular period of the year uh, in in Rome because uh, the temperature in the city reached something like 40, 45 degrees. So anybody that is not forced to be there try to escape somewhere else. <laughs> Uh, where the temperature is, is a bit more um, more cool, and uh, and so it's really difficult to 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 gain people in the streets to to demonstrate and to do anything, and uh, as a matter of fact, the the municipal of Rome is really aware of this, and the and, and it's really likely that an eviction arrives at this time of the year, end of July, beginning of of August. So of course there was uh, uh, there was uh, another attempt, and uh, and we were pretty pretty scared because at, at that time we we already did you know a, a lot of things and we didn't know what 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 we could do for sure it would be at that time impossible to gain people uh, out in the streets so we thought about something that could work only that. that that could function, yeah, work on social network. And I haven't mentioned one important thing, that the building of Luce Siesta was owned at the time by, the, by ATAC, which is the company that runs the public transport in Rome. So we thought of an imaginary uh, bus, an imaginary line called the 8M, Linea Fuxia, which should connect all the mm, trans feminist place in, uh, in Rome as a kind of 
pink washing campaign by, by, by Attack. And we, we set up uh, a website which was very similar to, to the site of, of Attack. Just the, the, the domain was, was a bit different, was, was saying attack slash lineafuxia.com instead of dot it. And, um, and we produce uh, this, this first render that you see. So the, um, the bus, uh, the, the pink bus, it's of course a, a render while the, the one on, on the back is, is the color of, of a bus in, in Rome. And we produce also uh, a lot of design graphic of this, uh, how to say, path, a route of, of this imaginary bus. And then it started to become more real. <laughs> we also put on, on, on the bus stop, this one on, on the right is a, is a, is a Roman bus stop. Uh, we put the information of uh, of this bus uh, with all the, the stops were named with, 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 uh, with the different places squatted and non-squatted in, uh, in Rome. Uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, this, this is the path uh, in, on, a, on the map of, of Rome, which is a kind of a silly path. Yeah, it's like uh, it, it doesn't really make sense uh, to, to connect in, in this way this, this side of the city, but, but it was like presented as a, as a, um, yeah, as a pink washing, washing campaign. We also uh, designed this, this character uh, called the Sally Sul Bus. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to translate it, but for those who know Italian, it, 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 make, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. It's, it's, it's a joke. Sally, as a character, the name of the character is like "get on the bus," basically. Uh, and then, and then, of course, we put those uh, those posters under the bus shelters and on other advertising spaces. Uh, we also produced some uh, fake tickets that were advertising this. Uh, uh, this bus stop, and well, it ended up that it worked pretty well because the the, the people uh, that were already on holiday saw all this huge campaign and believe it to be to be through, and and so were scandalized on social network and started to write a lot of complaint to Attack because they were saying how how dare you uh, evicting such a such an important place as as Luce Siesta, and on the other hand. Uh, saying that you are doing all this, uh, all this thing for, uh, for our spaces, and uh, yeah, it helped uh, because uh, because the eviction didn't happen at all. Uh, ah, yeah, sorry, and and I think that's that's for now <laughs> the uh, the end of the the story with Luce Siesta. Now, what happened? That that Attack sold the the building. Uh, to pay some debts that, that the company had uh, to the region, and uh, and the region after after this campaign, the the, the region was uh, the politicians were promising to to legalize the the place, but then there was a change of uh, uh, leadership, as you probably know, the the um, the ruling party now in power is not in Italy is not really closed uh, with uh, trans feminists issues and so everything is freezed and, and we don't know what, what it will happen. Um, so uh, I, I hope I give you um, a, a bit of a view of what, uh, of what we do with this example and now I would like to take a step back on why, another reason of why we, we decided to to, to put this this website and the um, the reason was because of these two posters that were produced during a workshop um, in Rome uh, together with something like other 50 posters um, but those two in particular grabbed the attention of the media uh, because 
um, they they were believed by um, a right-wing politician to be official advertising. Uh, I don't know exactly how, but but yeah, this 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 uh, this guy basically was was completely shocked about 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 those posters and started to ask for the resignation of the mayor, and and the resignation of the the the, the politician responsible for public transport in Rome, and and both of them didn't say, look, those those are not are not authorized communication, but. Instead, said, uh, "Well, uh, we don't know nothing about it. It's it's probably the company of public transport that is responsible." And so, basically, there was like a, a bunch of responsibility uh, among those those people, and and a big scandal. Uh, I have to say that um, just two days before those two posters were were installed, uh, Cardinal Pell, which was uh, a very rich and horrendous uh, man was accused of uh, uh, sexually abused some children and uh, as a response he escaped uh, in Austria I think uh, yeah so well it was it was also um, a satire on uh, on this uh, uh, eternal story with with uh, with the Vatican, but yeah, basically uh, there was then um, uh, an investigation by by the police, and two the two artists were accused of being blasphemous because in Italy in Italy it's still illegal mm, to to. Mm, to use uh, religious uh, images in in a way that the the church uh, doesn't think is uh, is okay, and uh, and actually the maximum of penalty uh, for for the law is two years in in jail. So uh, we <laughs> so basically we decide well what if we like put put for free all of our our design. So if this shit happens again we we can say well it wasn't it wasn't us that, that did the action it was uh, someone else uh, and that's how we started to, to to work on the on the website uh, and I'm also telling you this because uh, ah, well yeah, here here there are some some screenshot uh, from uh, Giorgia Meloni and uh, and Matteo Salvini that Mm, later on, we're, we're, um, we're trying to, to uh, yeah, to, to denouncing these uh, these this posters. And um, mm, as a, as a defense, what we tried to do, because we, we had a, a court case, uh, we were mm, showing those posters in different art contexts, and one of the, the defense was saying, uh, th "This this is freedom of expression is." Uh, is uh, is an art piece, and so uh, you can't uh, put us in jail for, for just for a drawing. Uh, but but yeah, th there were there were different steps. Those screenshots are from two years after the the first scandal, and uh, while we were exhibiting those those two posters in in an exhibition in a museum in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Rome. As a result, the director of the museum was uh, fired, and and a demonstration was organized uh, in in Rome with 2,500 people uh, to, to that were asking for um, uh, harder punishment, whatever. So well, we um, uh, we did then. Um, a documentary that then it became a, a kind of mockumentary uh, around uh, all, <laughs> all this story, and um, and we actually presented just uh, la last week at Post Porn Film Festival in uh, in Warsaw. Uh, that was a, as an, an amazing festival run by uh, really passionate people. And, uh, and actually, Poland is 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 the only other country state in uh, in in Europe where the same uh, um, 
the same action is, is, is considered to be criminal and punished with two years in jail. So, uh, so it, was, it was important for us to, to present our, uh, our, story, our story there. And uh, now the, um, the film is, is published on, on Vimeo. I, I invite you to, uh, to look for it on, uh, on our website. And uh, yeah, if you if you like it, so you can you can share it. You can yeah, watch it. Do how how long does it take? Did, do I have still time to to show a short video? No. Okay. <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much. Um, I pass the mic. Thank you so much. And maybe, uh, maybe somehow we can still see that short video because now I really want to see it. <laughs> so, Michel Tilitki was born in New York City, um, a Polish immigrant's parents. Uh, is an artist and activist based between UK and Portugal. She studied experimental film at FAMO in Prague, the Czech Republic in 2007, and graduated with Master's of Arts degree from ASP, Gdansk, Poland in 2010. Since her thesis on art and activism, she has contributed to local, national, and international campaigns focusing on radical system change. Her work promotes climate justice, animal rights, anti-capitalism, sex workers' rights, ending blasphemy laws, and reshaping the world as an anarchist utopia. She often takes part in creative direct action on front lines of these activist movements. In her art, Tilichki creates subversive graphic design to critique advertising, subvertising, utopian illustration for grassroots collectives and short films about creative direct actions. She also explores physical theater, producing and directing a climate clown wrestling troupe, troupe and installation work like the anti-fascist catapult and fridge full of humanly slaughtered human meat. She lectures subvertising history and skill shares DIY aspects of ad hacking. Michelle, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, wow, this is pretty dreamy. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, I'm going to do a little show and tell of different tactics and mediums and also tell my story, how I arrived at the different uh, projects that I've been in, uh, involved with. Uh, can everyone hear me? Is that good? Yeah, great, great, great. A little bit louder. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to start out uh, with uh, my parents that you can see up there. I hope they managed to tune in <laughs> to watch from Poland. Hello, mom and dad. <laughs> Um, this is them in New York City, and I wanted to uh, pay homage to their influence on me. My father is a conceptual artist who ran a now gallery in the East Village in the 80s, and my mother for just having the most fantastic imagination and supporting all of these crazy projects that we've all been doing over the years. So, oh, I have a little clicker. <laughs> I can go this way. Yeah, I would like to start with this piece. Um, I was actually studying in Poland, but also found my way to uh, London and uh, was living in a squat in East London for quite a few years. That was like an anarcho-communist uh, animal rights themed kind of crew. And uh, we were doing a lot of different um, actions that were kind of the direct action, the classic animal rights activism. And I was writing my thesis on uh, art and activism. So I tried to do like a theatrical performance. So we went to um, Brick Lane, which is a famous place where they, they do a lot of like fur um, selling. And I created these animals that were kind of like the ghost animals of um, the creatures that had no voices. And what was interesting was people's reactions to it when I wasn't proposing all of this really dark, catastrophic things that we do to animals, but show this instead. And so they were a lot more interested 
in the subject uh, and were kind of more uh, open to learning about it. And I think for me as an artist, that was a very big like aha moment that actually if we intrigue people with it, they can uh, be yeah, more open to discussing it and going away with, with something new. Um, so I think tone is a really big part of my work. And while this was an earlier one, I soon discovered that actually humor is a little bit more of a, a way to lure people in. So um, when I was uh, finding myself in the warehouse scene in London, uh, I met a lot of really interesting people that had really amazing skills like wrestling, like clowning, and decided to make a clown wrestling group of clowns that are uh, fighting for the climate. <laughs> And we had, here you can see fossil fuels versus renewables. You have tidal power versus oil. And uh, <laughs> we, I produced and, and directed this, this show and we have lots of different characters. You have in the top right, solar power. Below it, um, you have wind power, oil on the top left and fracking gas. There's also, <laughs> There's also a corrupt referee, uh, which is taking money from the fossil fuels. And we also have coal power, an elderly lady, because she's been around the longest, that, yeah, that fights against these other guys as well. So I'm going to show a few um, situations where we performed. So I found that um, doing this kind of street actions makes it accessible as an art form. And often we'd be doing it as like a morality support for activists that would be on the front line. So for example, at blockades or occupations to just entertain the people that are there for days sometimes taking action. Um, we started out uh, against the, f it, like it was part of uh, two weeks of direct action against fracking in the UK, where we went as a decoy to let the security, hey, come look at us. What are we doing with our sparkly outfits and humor while friends that were ninjas climbed on top of a building and dropped some banners talking about, uh, yes, the climate messaging against fracking. Um, in the top right, you can see me uh, being body slammed <laughs> um, at one of the blockades. Um, yes, so that was uh, an earlier project which focused on collaboration and working with lots of people in a non-hierarchical um, project. So thank you to all my friends that were involved in that. Um, and yes, so we have the anti-fracking movement. We had it for almost a decade um, in the UK. And the actual company name uh, that does fracking there was called Quadrilla, which was asking to be made into a spoof horror film uh, poster. So as a Steal this poster crew mentioned uh, subvertising is like a technique of reclaiming toxic advertising spaces with uh, a subversive messaging. So maybe something that you've seen before, but when you look again, it has like a second meaning. So Quadrilla um, was the company that does the fracking and actually, if you can see the details, you have like universal nightmare. <laughs> and actually a few days after, or a week or something after this poster, we managed to actually win um, after all of that campaigning. So it's it's kind of a celebratory piece for me to, to see that action works when we work all together. Um, yeah, and so here is a poster. Uh, it was a billboard actually that I made for Brandalism, which is a UK subvertising collective. Uh, they invited to make this one about car advertising and it was installed illicitly in London to take back advertising spaces. And I'm gonna show a short film that Brandalism made about it. My name is Michelle Talitsky. I made the Destination Climate Chaos piece. For this campaign, I took my subvertisement to the underworld of the paintings of Hieronymus Bosch. In his renditions of hell, especially in the Garden of Earthly Delights, you have the creation and damnation scenes of perverse descent. In my collage of his work, my SUV is presented in a hellscape where man can barely be distinguished from beast, a question of humanity's place and nature amidst the nonsensical scene of gluttony. Car commercials are made to inspire wanderlust. All the epic orchestral music, dynamic landscapes you can only explore by car. 
My piece is about being wander lost, lost trying to chase this feeling, discovering that natural world, because in the case of super SUVs, you're simultaneously contributing to its destruction. SUVs are larger and heavier than standard cars, emitting four times more CO2 than electric vehicles. Electric vehicles. In my piece, I chose the Lamborghini Ursus as it's the most excessive supercar SUV. Advertising such luxury commodities plays into the issue of buying social acceptance. No one needs such a machine. They're buying respect through materialism, valuing economic accumulation. Hell has been brought about by consumerism, by overindulgence, and by ego. Right. Um, so that was part of the beginning of our campaign with Brandalism that is called Ban Fossil Ads, and that is about banning high carbon uh, advertising of SUVs, of airlines, like still this poster mentioned, uh, the KLM ad earlier, which is actually landing them in court for greenwashing. So we're on a roll. Um, and the next uh, element that I made for that campaign Oops, wrong way, this way, Oop, nope, this way, <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, so this is another from that series of reusing um, great masters paintings and that uh, top bit is the actual artwork that went up around uh, Europe to highlight the misleading advertising and aggressive lobbying tactics of Toyota in particular to name and shame a, a corporation. Um, because advertising grotesquely shapes our consumer choices. Toyota's petrol and diesel SUVs are still being advertised while their greenwashing claims them to be beyond zero. And they are the worst as anti-climate lobbyists as a car company in the world. So by blocking climate policies, they're directly contributing to worsening climate devastation and uh, paying billions for marketing spin to persuade the public for their products as environmentally friendly. So this, these went up all around Europe as a, as a group that um, ban fossil ads are demanding more robust policy from governments to regulate advertisement and environmentally harmful products and prevent misleading green claims by big polluters. So uh, as a result of that, we've actually already had some wins. Uh, Amsterdam in 2020 has banned all fossil ads. Um, also France, uh, with their, they're really amazing in campaigning on this campaign. Uh, and also I think Stockholm and in the UK, it's, it's really warming up to, to make it happen uh, and is already happening, so yay for that. Um, okay, yeah, this one. <laughs> So this is in front of the British Museum. Uh, and there was a Troy exhibition happening in, uh, inside the museum. And we managed uh, with this uh, activist group. So they do a lot of performances. The group is called BP or not BP. <laughs> um, challenging the art washing of uh, the BP uh, oil company that put their logo inside the British Museum. Um, and so this giant Trojan horse was actually snuck into the main front area of the British Museum and then occupied that space while we were uh, campaigning about that. Um, uh, I managed, I got to do the sketch drawing of the horse and it's pretty f awesome to see it in 3D and making these actions happen. I'm just gonna say a really quick um, quote from people involved in BP or not BP, talking about this. Um, so the Troy exhibition has inspired us to create this magnificent beast because the Trojan horse is the perfect metaphor for BP sponsorship. On its surface, the sponsorship looks like a generous gift, but inside lurks death and destruction. It's our 40th performance intervention at the B British Museum after 10 years of, of actions, theatrical actions on this scale. Uh, and actually, literally last week, uh, the British Museum has dropped their BP sponsorship. Um, yes, yeah. Okay, all right. And okay, I'm gonna show a short film that I made. 
Um, oh, not yet, not yet. Can we go back? I'm just going to introduce it a little bit, sorry. <laughs> so um, this one is to support fellow sex workers because sex work is work. And we call for our safety of all women. And um, I'm just going to read a little bit of text. So sex workers and subvertisers have found that their art and activism have a lot in common. They both engage with masks and social rituals of respectability and normality, exposing social fictions and misrepresentations and the ways in which power constrains and manipulates desire. So. This is a, a project that I did with uh, actual sex workers and artists and illustrators and designers that they, that they also do this on the side, as well as allies, and it shows um, a, a bunch of special patrol group hacking bus stops in solidarity with sex workers. So we can play that, it's a three minute film. So just a shout out to some of the artists involved that were that you could see there. You can find some of their artwork on Steal This Poster. Uh, one, some of the artwork is done by One Slut Riot, Double Y, also myself and um, fellow sex worker friends. Um, all right, uh, next. So this is uh, really nice to be back in the space where we are now because actually an exhibition that we curated in the Kunstraum Batanien last summer, um, I was lucky enough to uh, curate a blasphemy church, which included some of the artworks mentioned by Steal This Poster um, that were, uh, yeah, scandalous. <laughs> um, and it feels good as a Polish person also to be able to do this so close to the Polish border where you have blasphemy law. Uh, and so here is a little altar that we did. And I wanted to talk about the artwork that I made for it, which is the stained glass windows. 
Um, and this was inspired by a book called Witches, Midwives, and Nurses, uh, which is on the corruption of the medical establishment and its role in demonizing women healers. Uh, it's a tribute to the witches burned, to the women murdered in, throughout history. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can celebrate the midwife for helping women gain reproductive agency. And it features in the bottom Latin names of plants used as medicine for contraception, abortion, childbirth, and to alleviate menstruation and menopause. And on the left, you have the celebration of the indigenous witch for protecting the sacred forests and who, in sharing her knowledge with the of plant medicine made it accessible to aid uh, the poor and vulnerable. Her insight and practice forged the base of three-fourths of modern pharmacology's plant-based remedies. And in the bottom, you can also um, see common medicinal plants still used today. So that was really great to do uh, for our blasphemy church. <laughs> uh, and just checking how much time do I have? Is it good? Yeah, okay, great. I'm almost at the end. So I'm just going to show some more illustration work that I've done as solid, Solidarity Projects. This is a piece that I made for Dope Magazine um, along an article about the oppressive reality of video game industry workers, how exploitative it is, and uh, about hope in unionization and how that's how we can fight for better better rights. Um, I really recommend Dope Magazine. It's a solidarity project where they sell, they give the, the newsprint to uh, any vendor, often homeless people, and uh, uh, they get to keep all of the proceeds from it. So it's like a solidarity action in itself. Recommend that. Um, where were we? Yeah, here we go. Uh, here's another illustration for that, which is kind of more of that utopian science fiction influence, uh, which is another article that was called Abolish Science Fiction that was also in Dope Magazine, uh, talking about alternatives to the prison system that we have today. Uh, and you can read all of these articles uh, on Dope uh, on the website. I'm going to add a little link at the end. Um, yes, so that's going to be... Right. Oh, um, I'm, maybe I'll skip that just for time. Okay. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to bring back here to Germany, which probably a lot of people might ident uh, know about Enda Galenda. Uh, I was involved for quite a few of the actions. It is essentially a mm, we just invasion of the massive coal pit <laughs> uh, by activists. Uh, there's like the largest uh, open cast coal mine in, Euro in Europe, I believe, right? Um, and uh, so it's like Enter Galenda is a direct action group that goes to um, block it, essentially. And I wanted to mention this in particular because this is the first time I came across uh, anti-facial recognition makeup when the police were trying to process all of the people that had broken through the police lines and were occupying the mine. Uh, and there was just no way for them to process all of us because it's like an en masse action. And that was the first time I came across that, and it was inspiration for creating our project that you can check out over there, Dazzle, um, our little subversive beauty salon, so that you can learn what you need to do to trick uh, computer vision systems. Uh, and yeah, do have a go uh, after our talk. That would be great to have a, have a chat as well. Thank you, Michelle. My first question to, for all of you here um, as artists in the panel, it's clear that we're using the avant-garde artist tactics to, to transgress and to, to um, as techniques and as methodology to fight the system in whatever shape you see. But I, I want to start this um, conversation in a way by asking all of you to maybe chime in and to tell me or, and tell the audience, um, what is your relationship yourself with the art world or art in general and, and the institution um, of art? Because I've 
I, um, I think that a lot of the work that we heard during the conference and even today and tonight um, is about, of course, collaboration. And, and a lot of the times this sort of like um, what you mentioned earlier, the, um, the bipolar idea of both working against the system and at the same time understanding um, that you have to sleep with the devil to get somewhere, right? Um, sort of this dichotomy of also being an artist and an activist and artivist, right? This, um, how do you deal and how do you think, what, what do you think is the role of the artist in, in those very, very large scale movements? I mean, these are global movements. These are no longer a critique on consumerist society and you know, these are, these are actions that all of you have undertaken and that's why I talk about you as, 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 and as incredible heroes, power heroes, right? Because it's a lot to just simply organize a campaign. It's, it's massive in, and, and so again, I wanna maybe have all of you chime in and, and talk a little bit about your relationship with, with yourself in terms of the work it, as you do um, as an artist, as an activist, um, where do you balance that power and that sort of, you know, relationship with art? Jin? Thank you, I know. Big question. Um, so I think there is, at one hand, the inspirational force of art that can transgress over borders and time and people with different backgrounds and situations and and in, yeah, inspire a protest and, and, and keep it going. We all know this, this fist. Um, and, and on the other hand, for example, in Germany, there are art institutions like theaters and galleries and whatever and, and the legal background of art. And that is something where I see a major role in institu art in institutions nowadays because they can give a shelter for activists. Um, like, like in your case, this, this kind of legal, um, there's a, 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 a gray area where you can shelter people um, by, I don't know, like putting up, you, you can go in cooperation, um, cooperations um, with them and then just stamp it, okay, this is art. Um, yeah, there I see a, a huge potential also for, like we, we heard about in the, in the last panel, uh, the Letzte Generation and their actions there. Something that, that came to my mind while we, I was uh, listening to the people on, on stage was like, so where, where does it leave us? What can we do to support them? And that would be something that, that all of these institutions could do. They could defend it and not go with the narrative of maybe the Springer Press or whatever to say, oh no, they are attacking the art or whatever. No, they're fucking protecting it. There is glass in front of it. They are not attacking the art, but they are attacking the status quo. And we as people uh, that work with this, uh, status quo and always challenging it, we, we see them as allies and we want to give them maybe our support in whatever way that is and that is something that we can think of uh, if we're in these uh, institutions, what could that be, this, this kind of support? You want to go first? Shall I go? Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a big question and uh, that describe a really complex relationship. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the, the artists involved in, in still these posters came from different backgrounds. You can, you can look to, to, to all the contributors on, uh, on, our, on our site, of course, uh, but mainly uh, they are illustrators, uh, animators, designers, and uh, painters as well. Uh, the, the site, was, I, I haven't mentioned before, that the site is, the website is also a 
joint venture with hackers that we met during a hack meeting, which is an um, um, international uh, gathering of, of uh, ethical hackers that happens once in a year in, in Italy. But um, so, um, so in relation to, to, to this relationship with, with uh, art and, and institution, um, I can say uh, that we, we are here um, presenting political art, but I think that every form of art is political in the sense that every form of uh, an expression of oneself or, or, or a collective through an aesthetical form is political. And so um, if this expression doesn't challenge the main narrative, it means that it's simply uh, aligned with it. So uh, every art, every form of art is political. This is maybe what, like what we try to do is, is trying to represent a different narrative from, from the main one. And, uh, and of course, the, the, the relationship is sometimes complicated, but, but mm, uh, in this society we have to make a living and so to compromise sometimes to, to just to live, yeah? <laughs> that was such a wide question. Could you repeat maybe a fragment of it? <laughs> or this was more like, wow, kind of question. I wanted to kind of like be succinct and it came like really long winded. Okay. But basically I w I'm, I'm interested to know, for, for example, you as Michelle, as a body, as an artist, how do you, what is your role in the projects that you create and you collectively move forward, right? What is the, do you, do you have to balance your relationship to the art world and to the fact that you're an artist with the activist part, right? Where does the art become the impact of the many, and as you said, where where do we see that as, as an art, yet something that is impactful enough to stop climate change, for example, right? Yes. Where, where does that balance okay. lie for you? Yeah. Um, so as I a woman, as an artist. Yes. I think that my work kind of feels like it lies outside of the art world. Like, I don't often exhibit in white cube spaces. It's more about, like, making it accessible on the streets, doing it, uh, including lots of people from the public so that it's very visible um, and not exclusive, I think, whereas the art world can often be that. And I think, yeah, I feel like I don't really exist in that world so much. Even though it is creative work that I'm doing, I try not to venture too much into the art market <laughs> in that way, yeah. And then as a you know, producer yourself, do you feel that your body is important within the projects? That your, your body as yourself is important, like your role within the projects? Being female or identifying Be Being female. your body, like yourself, yes. Because we talked about anonymity and we talk about collectivism a, a lot with the work has to do with that and organizing. So again, like the role of the artist within the active activism um, I guess like influence as a as a female artist okay um, I guess I could talk about um, the subvertising movement the subversive advertising ad hacking that we do and uh, there's not since I got involved five years ago there's not very many female artists involved um, double Y one slut riot sees the mean also auto Enganis in Barcelona uh, are just a few that I'm aware of and that I've met and worked with. Um, so maybe there's not that many, um, but in my work in the films, the short films that I make, I like to portray, uh, I'll just grab friends to do the actual actions so that you can see female um, identifying people putting up uh, the artworks. And as a result, lots more um, women have been coming to the workshops. I've seen that change over the time of five years. Uh, a lot of young uh, teenage girls, which is really cool that they're up for mischief. 
Um, so it feels like that is kind of shifting slowly and I'm excited for that. I wanted to mention that um, I can also take questions from the audience and also our online audience can also ask questions and uh, we'll patch them through. So maybe at this point, take some questions from the audience. I see somebody. Uh, thanks for all the presentations today, really inspiring. Um, one thing that I found missing though is about arts and activism used to fight back for inhabitable space because we do a lot of work that we do burn out from by fighting these massive entities of, that are destroying our planet, but we also need to find out how can we create these autonomous zones where we can extract ourselves from the capitalist uh, exploitations and be able to find sustainable forms living together. And I would just recommend um, one of my favorite books of the last couple of years, is we are nature defending itself. And these activists really describe a way of fighting for territory that we can live in. So the Zod, for example, was a project to try to fight back, to build a village, a community, a commune, whatever forms you wanna make of it, to get out of these, these traps that are, are gonna get tighter and tighter in terms of neoliberal austerity, making it very difficult for us to even find time to fight against oil companies and energy companies. And not to say that doesn't need to happen. We absolutely have to fight for the, the, the no and the yes at the same time. So I would just offer that up as a constructive territory to think about and if you have any feedback on that, because I really appreciated that the panel ends on a, a Viter Zo kind of group that is self-analyzing and how do we how do we figure out how we're going to win more victories out of our struggles thank you for the question anybody from the online audience okay so is a question for uh, still this poster um, um, isn't, po isn't it possible to track back your identity from the website? Track back, sorry? Is it possible to track back your identity from the website? Uh, no. Technically? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, uh, I'm, I'm me personally, I'm not um, a programmer, I'm not an, an expert, so maybe I'm not the, the right person to answer this question, but as, as I was mentioning before, still this poster is a joint venture with hackers, the hacker community from Hack Meeting, and we, like, when, when we came up with, with this idea, with the necessity of having an anonymous domain, uh, we realized how difficult it is in the internet 2.0, let's say, so in, 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 in the internet of nowadays, because you can be easily tracked with, with uh, an IP, and, uh, and when, when you buy a domain, you usually you, you need a, a, a credit card or a debit card uh, which is registered uh, with, with a name. So it was quite complicated. I don't know how this is possible, <laughs> how <laughs> was it done, but, but, mm, but yeah, there are, to, to mask an IP, you can use uh, like Tor browser or other mm, software and to buy an anonymous registered domain, I don't know. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's, it's complicated, uh, but, but possible. Any other question from the animal since we Still glued to the computer, yeah. Um, if I may, maybe to have a comment to the, the comment we had before because it's, it's a very important comment, I think. And a few weeks back, um, someone told me about a concept which made a lot of sense to me and explained a lot of things that I was 
kind of thinking, but not in a concept way. And maybe um, some of you also would like the concept because um, we were at this like activist conference festival thing and talking about which ways of doing activism are most impactful and most important. And we all know the discussions of the people who go to free spaces and live the, the new society that they want. And then the people who are in the old system and are like, why are you taking yourself out of the, out of the political struggle and just doing your thing? Well, on the other hand, there's people going into political parties and trying to change them from within and then the people outside. Um, are mad at them because they bow to the logic of the party and we all know these um, infighting tendencies. Um, and someone told me about the concept of the, the three pillars of activism where you need three, actually all the three things. So you need the symbiosis, the, the people who go into the institutions, who work within the institutional logic to change them from within and of course they have to maybe throw away some of their ideals if they want to join a party. Um, um, and then we also need the, the free spaces where people go and go outside of the system logic and try to build the utopia that they are fighting for, even if it means that they take themselves out of the like direct struggle or the institutions. And then we need the, the third pillar, is called the break. Um, we need the people who try to, to do the campaigning and they, the good, that's a good thing that where it all comes together because they can talk to the people within the institutions and the people in the institutions can take the radical um, movement ideas into the institutions and also the people who are doing the campaigning can point at the people who are living in the free spaces and tell everyone, look, that's what it could look like. And um, the thinking together of these three things um, I think makes much more sense than what we do a lot as a movement, I think. Okay, go ahead. So I guess waiters already replied to this, but if you want, you can also comment on that. Have you ever sat at the table with some power representatives like politicians or privates? And do, to what extent would you do it? Do you think this is somehow not your role as activists or activists? Um, definitely we would and we'd strive to do so. <laughs> um, because that's, that's for us one of our goals to go where the decisions are taken and um, for us, that means sometimes trying to learn the, the language of the other side, be it the conservative speech and trying to put progressive ideas into conservative speech so the people who, who are within the party actually even understand what you're saying. Because if we talk in our language, that we talk in our bubble, they won't understand what we're saying or they hear our speech and they immediately reject it. And at the same time, for example, when we went to that conference, um, that was another example of trying to assimilate a bit so that people even take you seriously and you also have to show them when you talk to them that you are knowledgeable in the field and that you know the basic facts of um, the gas industry um, so they start even listening to you and when they start listening to you, you can try to convince people of some things that you want from them but it's always important to consider where there's something to gain and where isn't and going to the CEO of Wintershall and telling him, can you please stop doing that? It's harming the climate. It's, that's probably a waste of time. Um, whereas with these uh, communal energy suppliers, that's where we're focusing on them, they are very much dependent on their public image and of what their customers think, of what the local politicians in their communities think of them. And when you go talk to them, and make it believable for them that it's harming their image to be part of a gas lobby group that's connected to the Russian gas industry, um, it can actually change something um, in their thinking and in their, um, in their practice. And I think that's, um, that is actually happening right now and it's quite a good, um, quite a good start for the campaign, I think. So I also have a question. Um, actually, more than a question is uh, something a bit concrete that I want to ask both to steal this poster and writers so, and to steal this poster in relation to this debate about uh, being part of an art space or not uh, and uh, 
the role of art. Uh, I think it's also important to remind the great uh, exhibition that you did uh, last year. You know, you still this poster, uh, Michelle, many other advertisers, actually the international movement of advertising downstairs at the Kunstram Kreuzberg Britannia. And I know that uh, you are going to publish a catalog soon that could be interesting for the audience to know, to read better what you do and uh, read about the history of the movement and understand uh, a bit more also about the exhibition that you curated last year. And then for the Viter So, perhaps you could tell the audience a bit concretely what you are going to do at the workshop tomorrow. So if people still want to subscribe, I think they can do from our website, uh, uh, since we will meet tomorrow afternoon at Super with you. I think it would be nice to give some concrete uh, information. Thank you very much for um, mentioning it, Tatiana. The, um, yeah, we, um, we are working on a catalog of an exhibition that happened last year, and it will be published by Doc Section Press, which is a new UK-based uh, publisher in the next uh, few months, hopefully. You can uh, get, get the book uh, through Doc Section Press website and few copies also from Kunstrom as soon as it will be ready. Um, tomorrow, oh, thanks again. Um, tomorrow in the workshop we're gonna um, go a bit more in detail with our methodology of this impact orientation and what we call smart tees. So we kind of develop the different version of this smart concept. Um, and from there on, we work with some case studies and we are very, very curious to learn from the people uh, who join the workshop and their um, if they are part of some groups or whatever, what what ta tactics they use, what kind of uh, thoughts uh, they they with with what assumptions they work and, and so on and so forth. So if if there's anybody here who wants to join the workshop and there is no uh, space available tomorrow, we won't reject you at the door. And there is also space, so please come. <laughs> we we we'd love to work uh, learn from you. And yes, it's at the uh, super, I, think I, I didn't look that up. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Was there one more question there? Or? Okay. Right, so we finished. Yes. Oh, we can finish with the video, okay. <laughs> Thank you so very much, everyone. Let's Thank finish you. with the video. Okay, great idea. <laughs>so the, the video that I'm gonna show you it's a kind of a teaser I would say of uh, of the short uh, mockumentary that is now mm, available the one that we presented at, at the postpone film festival it it, it mocks the uh, the aesthetic of uh, of um, why does it, it doesn't work the screen Maybe, maybe you can send it from remote mode. Uh, it mocks the aesthetic of, of a um, TV newspaper, and TV news, sorry. And, and yeah, it was, it was done with, with, with zero budget and, and shoot in, in one day. But after, after that we, we published it just to, to, to have fun and to kind of described the situation, it happened that, that people online believed it to be true. And, and as it's made really poor, well, yeah, poorly, with, with like not many technical instruments, uh, we get the idea that it's, it's, it's possible to do something more, uh, uh, how to say, uh, more structured and, and then, and then we, we did uh, this, this other 20 minutes uh, 
video, but yeah, let's 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 play it, please. Hello, this is Mary Jones from Very Regular News Indeed. And in Rome, the capital of Christianity, a wave of moral panic was caused by two abusive posters, paedophile Jesus and lesbian Holy Mary. Lo trovo di una offensiva di una volgarità senza senso. Fotografare. Che è orribile. Che è il genio. As the two artworks were placed under glass in bus shelters, people thought they were authorized communication. Politicians accused each other of being responsible, and a special police squad was engaged to find the artists. How did the two rascals get access to the cabinets? <coughs> Anyone with a little DIY know-how can do it. You need a metal tube, 14 millimeter in diameter, with a nick on the upper side. Hoger and Double Y, these the pseudonyms of the two vandals, are prolific pirates of outdoor advertising. Finally, they will be brought to court and charged with blasphemy. But apparently, the two are working on another evil plan to escape justice and avoid punishment. In order to do that, they will exhibit their work in an art gallery in South London. Let's hear the opinion of the owner of this tiny, cutting-edge gallery. Do you think selling sacrilegious material will exonerate the two scoundrels? <laughs> Um. So thank you very much also from my side. I was telling you before to, that in my conclusive part uh, I would ask you to leave the stage, but I think everyone is tired, we feel it's hot. So I will uh, just give uh, a little short closing, but first I want to thank you again for this uh, very wonderful panel, Michelle, Weiterso, still this poster, and Natalia. I think this was really a wonderful way to close this conference. Uh, and I just want to remember what happens tomorrow for the people that want to uh, follow the workshops. So we start at 11.30 with the workshop uh, investigative tactics to dismantle supremacist cuteness uh, from Noura Tafeshe. And uh, this uh, will be in the morning here at Studio One. Then there is the workshop uh, two uh, that we just uh, described with uh, Viter So. And this will be at 2.30 at uh, Super, that is uh, basically in Moritzplatz. You will find it, the address uh, is on the website. And then the workshop uh, uh, that will follow here in the afternoon, starting at 3, is a listening structure, a collective practice for big text interrogation con Yasmin Budiov. So the workshop of Nura is actually sold out, uh, but uh, the workshop in the afternoon you can still subscribe. So uh, the, this is the beauty of having two workshops at once. There is still space, so you are free to do. And uh, I also want uh, to just mention what we will do next uh, here at the Disruption Lab, just uh, briefly. Uh, we will have the next uh, meetup as part of our uh, community program uh, of September 25, uh, no, 26, sorry, um, at uh, Akuds. And this time, the person that will run the workshop is our dear Sabrina, Bar uh, Sabrina Barcucci, that is also our great uh, project manager. And uh, we are still discussing this, the topics, but probably will be something around uh, long-termism. So, you know, this uh, well-discussed topic, and uh, we will get uh, more information uh, online soon through our website. And then we are also planning uh, a film screening that will be the 30th of August at Akuds, that is entitled, We Are All Going to Die. Uh, relating also to the global crisis and the climate crisis uh, with uh, the film by Ben Knights. Uh, and we are also inviting uh, Extinction Rebellion Berlin. So this is great, come. And uh, finally, I want uh, to say the next conference. So the last of this year will be November 24 until 26. It's called Organized Crime, a Global Business. Uh, and we will analyze the complexity of organized crime and corruption at the global scale 
uh, speaking about money laundering uh, and the connection between politics, uh, real estate, speculation and drug trafficking. I will curate this conference together with Mauro Mondello, that is a great Italian journalist. Uh, uh, I already curated with him two conferences. One was about the ISIS media propaganda and the other was about uh, smart cities. So this will be the third one we curate together. Please come. And uh, so I still want to remind you then that we have our wonderful membership cards if you want to become a member of the Disruption Lab and also our Telegram channel if you want to follow what we will do next. So finally, I want to thank everyone, the audience online, the team of the Disruption Lab, the speakers and everyone that has been here so long until late uh, in this wonderful summer day. Thank you.